This is panel 16, Curating SF. I am, once again, very excited uh, for this panel with um, curators from some of the most distinctive uh, collections of science fiction and fantasy, um, scholars and creative writers in their own right. So with us today, we have Jeremy Brett from Texas A&M University, who will be going first. Then we have Kate Coker, am I pronouncing your last name? Fantastic, from the University of Illinois. Uh, and uh, they will be delivering the paper, Genre, Gen <clears throat> Gender, Genre, and the Limits of the Archive. And then uh, finally, we have uh, Dr. Phoenix Alexander from the University of California, Riverside. <clears throat> Curator of the Eaton Collection, uh, fantastic um, creative writer, yes, who will be delivering a paper, Excessive Corpse, the Radical SF of Jody Scott. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera and mute myself and hand the floor over to uh, Jeremy Brett. Please feel free to drop in comments uh, and questions in the chat. And uh, now it's on to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. All right, let me make sure my screen is, all right. Everyone can see that, yeah? Yes. Yeah, I don't hear a no, so sweet, okay. Uh, good morning, thank you all for coming today to our panel. Um, and it's my uh, custom to generally set low expectations for mine, so you should know I am the least academic person to ever appear at an academic conference, so I want you all to set your expectations accordingly. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about today about fan works in libraries and archives, uh, with particular reference to media fanzines and media fandom, which is particularly interest of mine. So I will jump right in. Okay. So the title of my presentation comes from this particular um, uh, particular uh, collection of, of fan stories. So this quote comes from a series of born digital fan stories, uh, the Media de Malfoy archive, which uh, Texas A&M archives in cooperation with the creator. Uh, they collectively represent a fantasy universe rooted in multiple identities and desire to free and creative expression. Uh, the meta voice and overlapping identities of Mina represent several metaphors for the fantasy archival experience. Within archives, it collects fan works. The researcher encounters numerous voices and identities, often hidden behind various names, and the materials with a fantasy collection not only documents a particular fandom, um, but also chronicle how fans react to and respond to the fandoms of each other, as well as to interpretations of the content and its expression. Uh, this also allows researchers, casual patrons, and fans alike to explore the ongoing and evolving voices of different types of fans, as well as their presences across various divisions and genres of fandom. So what you can blame the archive for is for creating spaces in which new generations can learn about the passionately creative record of engagement and excitement that people have had with science fiction over the last century. Okay, so what is an archive? Excuse the... Uh, so, um, that's, that is itself its own presentation. It's more than institutions, more than a simple collection of documents, publications, and objects. What is an archive? What, it, what isn't an archives? It is not or should not be a gatekeeper closed space. Archives preserve the common historical and creative heritage of humanity as a whole. And as a result, we should be striving to introduce materials not only to scholars, but to members of the public, such as fans. By collecting and making accessible these kinds of materials, we attract fans to our institutions because we are making collecting and educational mandates relevant to their own interests. And we're demonstrating belief that their stories are important and worth saving. Those stories include at Texas A&M and elsewhere, um, including places like Riverside, uh, the stories of fans and materials they create. Uh, my presentation here, like I said, will focus specifically on early media fanzines, but of course, fanish activity is expressed in all kinds of ways, not just fanzines and fanfic, but through cosplay, through organizing attending cons, through filk song, through fan art, etc. Uh, media fandom is kind of an umbrella term that describes the deep interest fans and fan communities have for particular movies, television shows, and other broadcast and televised media. So um, you all know this, uh, nothing else you heard, you've heard Lisa Yazik speak about the early days of women in science fiction. Uh, we know that women had voices in the pulp era, not just as writers, but of course as fans who wrote into the letter columns. I'm not gonna go over this in great detail, but these are two examples from a particularly notorious letter exchange between uh, Mary Byers and Isaac Asimov in Astonishing Stories in 1938, 1939 and onward. 
Um, the exchange signifies some of the kinds of hostile or patronizing spaces that the letter pages and pulps could create for female fans. Uh, in the early days of fandom, these forums were primary sites and very, uh, very visible sites for fans' communication connection. And so if we're creating feelings of hostility or patron patro patronizing uh, towards female fans could have serious social repercussions. Um, now, this is not to say that the event that changed, there's no single event that changed the state of affairs, but certainly one uh, pivotal event in um, sort of uh, increasing the presence of women uh, in fandom is the introduction of Star Trek. Um, so Trek fandoms expressed in fan fiction is an expression of a desire for participation in media fandom by a growing female or female identifying fan base. Uh, as Lichtenberg points out in her book, Star Trek Lives, uh, these were some of the elements, quote, these were some of the elements which most intrigued people, which hooked into their own fantasies in profound ways, which cried out for more exploration, hence was one of the main sources for fan fiction. Uh, Lichtenberg's perspective is particularly valuable, by the way, because uh, she approaches fan history not as a disinterested scholar, um, which is not to say that one, one could also be an interested scholar, obviously, uh, but as a vital and active participant in early fan fiction. Uh, Lichtenberg herself wrote a great deal of, of fan fiction, um, particularly the story cycle of Kraith, uh, that something she wrote between 1970 and 1980. This is a story cycle uh, expanding on developing the complexities of Vulcan culture, emphasizing the Vulcan gift for telepathy as a central plot point, together with a background based on the idea of noble Vulcan lineages and family dynasties. Uh, this is the first issue of Kraith Collective, the collection of Lichtenberg's and other uh, Kraith stories written in that universe, uh, edited in November 1972 by Carol Lynn. So, um, so, but taking a step back from, from Lichtenberg, of course, media, fan, media fandom um, sort of began its life, as we understand it, with, while Star Trek was still on the air. The first media fanzine was uh, Spockanalia, introduced in uh, September 1967 uh, by Deborah Michelle Lang Langsam and Sherna Comerford. It launched a new wave of fanzine publishing based around specific media productions, uh, specific televised and broadcast media productions, obviously, there were fanzines before that dealing with uh, sort of quote unquote giants of the field, people like Tolkien and Lovecraft, but this is kind of a new way of looking at uh, fandom production. Media fanzine writing and production then is now was dominated uh, by women or female identifying creators and very highly centered in fanfic. Um, Spock and Elia, particularly important. It got it came to the attention of Gene Roddenberry himself, who uh, this letter from him to the editors was published in the third issue of Spock and Elia in September 1968, in which Roddenberry points out that uh, Spock and Elia is required reading for everyone in our offices. How true that is, I am not sure, uh, but it's certainly an interesting point to have made. Um, so we start to see mainly female and female presenting communities and creators developing fanfic themes and tropes that still function and in many ways define the genre today. Uh, particularly, one of the most important ones is Slash. Slash, as you all know, I'm sure, is a subgenre of fiction, focuses on same-sex relationships, sometimes romantic, sometimes sexual, often both. Uh, the pioneer in this uh, published fanfic trend is Star Trek. In fact, Slash comes from K slash S, which was the original term for Slash fiction, Kirk slash Spock. Um, we're not sure when the Kirk slash Kirk slash Spock relationship really first was envisioned, uh, but it seems likely that the early stories in Slash were generally passed among fan, fans hand to hand. Uh, Jennifer Guttridge's story here, which has been dated to around 1968, um, but was only actually published in 1987 in the Zine Alien Brothers, without, by the way, Guttridge's knowledge or approval. So it's become kind of infamous for that. Um, is one is considered one of the first, if not the first, stories to exist in this subgenre. Uh, generally, the first published slash story is agreed upon to be A Fragment Out of Time by Dan Marchant. It was published in the uh, September 1974 issue of the zine Grupp, uh, which was the first adult Star Trek fanzine. Um, it was edited by Carrie Peak and M.L. Barnes. This brief story by Marchant. The characters are never named in the story, but it was pretty much agreed upon based on context and by the, co and by the uh, art accompanying it. That is supposed to be Kirk and Spock. This was pretty much agreed. I'm sorry, that is a blurry image. I apologize. Um, the Marchant's essay in the next issue of Grub kind of uh, really determines that to be the truth. Marchant's essay also follows on articles in Spockanalia and on earlier letters from pulp magazines in that they provide forums for fans to express their concerned opinions and analyses of characters, plots, and stories. Media fanzines provided sites for female fans and female identifying fans in particular to safely and comfortably express their own opinions on these matters. It's just a fun one. I've done that and I've shown this one before. Uh, this is another example. So this is uh, December 1973 issue of Menagerie, uh, issue number two, another Star Trek scene. This story by Paula Smith with the kind of disturbing accompanying art there. 
Uh, a Trekkie's Tale is the first story to name and introduce through parody the uh, what the, the now infamous and time honored concept of the Mary Sue. Uh, that is where this little thing is where that comes from. Uh, so we see letter columns also starting in fanzines and apazines following on the conversational opinionated models we see in pulps. Uh, certainly in media fanzines, letters of comment, especially these early days of media fandom, are primarily women's spaces. Uh, one of the earliest letter columns in media fanzine is in Ruth Berman's uh, zine T Negative. This is from issue number seven, June 1970. Letters, uh, the letters of comment were a very popular form, and eventually you see entire letter zines being published. The first uh, Trek letter zine is Hulk and Council, 1974. Uh, this image is from Alderaan number one. As you can guess from the title, it is in fact Star Wars, not Star Trek. Um, it, it came out in February 1978. It's one of the first Star Wars zines complete uh, in, in history. Uh, this you know, fairly opinionated letter uh, is dated from October 1977. The movie had come out, the Star Wars had come out in May of 1977. So this is this is hot. This is hot off the presses we got back then. This this these opinions are being formulated and expressed while the movie is still in theaters. Um, as fan editor and uh, as fan writer and editor Maggie Malakoska uh, points out in a 2009 essay, uh, The Incomparable Junlin Wace, uh, sh the small numbers of letters in this one small issue of Alderaan's, only a couple pages, only a few letters, this, this one little package uh, examined a number of issues. As she, as she puts it, quote, the relevance of Star Wars as opposed to the relevance of Star Trek with side trips into whether women should be interested in what was essentially a boys adventure flick the derivative nature of Star Wars as opposed to more imaginative science fiction, the promotion of the military in science fiction uh, in Star Wars, Leia's status um, as a prize, Leia's status as a, quote, bossy, unfeminine person, and the question of who in actuality is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, Maggie notes that by the time Alderaan ceased publication in October 1981, nearly every Star Wars subject that would be discussed in the 10 years to come, save the revelations of Return of the Jedi, had been mentioned at least once in a letter of comment, and most of them by female fans. Uh, so we see media fanzines as increasingly vital sites for lively communication as well as creative expression. Very lively. This last image here, this is the cover uh, for issue number one of the Star Wars zine Against the Sith, which was published in April of 1978. It was edited by uh, two sisters, Nancy and Tracy Duncan. Uh, the Duncans were, became pretty infamous in Star Wars circles for their very strong opinions. They stridently disapproved of Princess Leia as a character. They loved Luke Skywalker. Um, they, they, they get into one debate, they get into one, uh, in one of their uh, editorials, they talk about how um, if a love triangle exists between Han, Luke, and Leia, it wouldn't last very long because Luke, being an honorable man, would withdraw as soon as he sees that Han and Leia are in love. To which I say, bless your heart, that's not why there's going to be a love triangle between Han, Leia, and Luke. Uh, wait for the Return of the Jedi and see how that turns out. Uh, they're also known for their Really, their hot, hot take, uh, uh, their utter hatred of the Empire Strikes Back. In fact, they canceled the zine against the Sith in 1980 because they did not want to be associated with Empire Strikes Back and what came afterwards. Um, just a few more. Uh, I want to keep on just talking a little about Star Wars. I don't think it gets as much play in fan history as Star Trek does, which is kind of which is kind of sad. There's a lot of stuff to be mined out of there. Uh, these are some of the other major uh, female or female identifying fans from the early days of Star Wars fandom. Um, Pat Nussman, this is, ooh, that is also really blurry. Again, I apologize. Um, this is an essay from Pat Nussman, which was originally published in Alderaan number 15. Um, she is asked, based, uh, Pat uh, Nussman is asking the question, how come there are a lot of more guys in Star Wars fandom? It's an interesting question to ask. Um, she said, quote, why, one of the reasons why Star Wars fandom is more, is heavily female, uh, quote, one involves the nature of creativity is related to the sexes in this country. The other, less esoteric, involves the sexual appeal of the male characters in the Star Wars saga. Um, whatever you may think of Nisman's reasonings, it's an interesting question to ask, particularly notably in view of the current fandom situation with Star Wars, which in the popular mind, anyway, uh, looks like sees, is always seems to be dominated by men, and there, of course, is an outspoken substrata of malcontents who are hostile female presences and pretty much anywhere in the Star Wars universe. Um, you also got uh, Bev Clark, who was a uh, co-edited along with Maggie uh, Skywalker, a well-regarded Star Wars zine, 1978, 1983, the first issue in April 1978. This is um, Clark's little uh, pitch on what she hopes Skywalker is going to be. Um, you have Susan Matthews. Uh, Susan was an early, uh, was well, still alive, uh, an early uh, Star Wars fan and fan writer. She got to make the great leap from fanfic to profic in rewriting a series of Star Wars stories she'd written between 19 and 1981 into her jurisdiction space opera series, starting with the 1997 novel, An Exchange of Hostages. This is one of her stories in that cycle, Koski's Last Hand. Uh, Linda Deneroff and 
Cynthia Levine under what is the best uh, fan publicate fan uh, press ever, uh, Mazel Tov Press. I edited the multimedia zine Guardian between 1978-1988, which focused on Star Trek and Star Wars. Uh, this issue here, number five in February 1983, contains the full-length fan novel Storm Brother by Fern Martyr and Carol Lasky, very well received. And uh, finally, Ming Wachney. Ming Wachney was a major big-name fan for Star Wars in the 80s and 90s. She was a writer and editor, and she's perhaps best known in, in my little neck of the woods as a zine librarian. Uh, Wachney maintained the Star Wars fanzine archives between 1981 and 1986. A uh, collection originally hold, held by Lucasfilm and then turned over to Watney. Uh, she expanded on that collection, turned into a circulating collection, the request being made in service via the mail. Uh, Watney turned the collection over in 2009, by the way, to the University of Iowa in cooperation with the Organization for Transformative Works as one of their first fan culture preservation project endeavors. Uh, the circulating nature of Watney's library was one way of exchanging creative work among a wider audience and networks of fans. Oh, this, by the way, is actually one of the zines she created. Um, so you have new female and female presenting driven fandoms uh, evolving over time. As media fandom progresses, we see the evolution of fandoms as social communities. Uh, Naomi Novik points out that, quote, fan fiction is not just written from one single person speaking to an audience. Rather, the stories are written within, from, and for a community, and these stories communicate with one another and communicate with what's in canon at that particular time. So you're starting to see these new social communities and networks popping up based around fanfic. Um, just going through a couple here that are particularly important in... Uh, early media fandom. These two issues are from the, uh, these two uh, fanzines are from the uh, show The Man from Uncle, spy show ran in the mid 60s, an early media fandom. The one on the left here, Karmic Concurrence from May 1988, edited by female fans Polly and Tammy Marie. Um, the one on the right is a slash zine, uh, Perestroika by Elizabeth Ulrich and illustrated by award-winning fan artist Susan Lovett. Uh, many media fans, fandoms and resulting fanfic are sparked by a deep interest in the emotional and physical relationship between two male characters in particular. Uh, media production centered on these types of relationships are well represented in fandom. Uh, just a couple others that you, you may or may not have ever seen. One on the left, Leather and Blue Jeans, number one. This is a slash scene from Gail Good from 1993. It is based on a nonfiction science fiction show, the British show The Professionals, which ran from 1907-1983. It's kind of a combination uh, spy cop show centered around uh, Bodie and Doyle, two, character, two, two male central characters. Interesting about the professionals, unlike other fandoms where it started out in zines, uh, professionals really started its life in what's called the circuit system. Originally, fans would write stories for each other and put them on the circuit, meaning they would circulate paper copies by mail. Uh, and eventually, some particularly industrious fans would gather these stories together and they created circuit libraries. You could join one of these libraries and you would get stories in the mail and you could read and or copy them out and then you return them and you would get more stories. Um, eventually, zines would come to the pro professionals fandom really later after circuits have been strongly established. Uh, professionals, very fervent fandom at the time, particularly rooted in Slash. Uh, that circuit archive, by the way, moved online. It still exists out there as an online collection containing both zines and vids. Second one there, uh, Starsky and Hutch, the cop show of 1979-1979, well, the first fandom to be based heavily and start out life as a Slash fandom, though not always. Uh, the first start, uh, Starsky and Hutch was Zebra 3, which started in 1977, um, and it is actually Jan. Also had a lending library curated by Linda McGee in the late 1990s. Last one to talk about here is Lorraine Bartlett, 1988. This is issue number one of Above and Below. It is from, as you can tell from the cover, age, the uh, Beauty and the Beast, that show for the 1980s. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, very gen-based fandom revolving almost exclusively around the romance between the characters Vincent and Catherine. Uh, it's a small but fervent fandom, still active, still highly dominated by women or female identifying uh, fans. Also notable, it also has its own lending library, the Crystal Rose Lending Library, which is still around. We have an online presence and a website. Last time I checked, they were still doing zines, requesting and lending them out in paper version, though, which is a kind of an interesting throwback. Uh, just to finish up here, so I see just sort of some kind of other interesting fandoms uh, going around here. Uh, these are all, all written by, most of these are written by women. Some are written under an alias. I don't know for a fact their gender. So that, that's kind of the interesting malleability of fanish identity. Uh, so fan work archives contain multitudes of different fandoms and fan activities, from the large, Star Wars and Star Trek, to the smaller, to pretty darn obscure. We have a ridiculous number of zines for fan for shows you may have never even seen, let alone heard of, uh, things like Highlander, the series, The Sentinel, Kung Fu, The Legend Continues, et cetera, et cetera. If there's any, any show that has ever been made, there is a zine for it. Um, to particularly note here, this one in the middle, this is the Terrible Zodin, which, as you could probably guess from the cover, is a Doctor Who zine. Uh, this is issue number 21. The editor of Terrible Zodin is Leslie McMurtry. Uh, Leslie McMurtry noted in her editorial for issue number one of this series, 
Quote, importantly, many of the contributors you will find are female. While Doctor Who Magazine's latest poll still showed the men outnumbering the women two to one, we are an undeniable presence and growing. I was tempted to make the terrible Zoden a fan magazine for women by women, but that's obviously missing the point. I want to show diversity, so why close off half the population? Certainly, we can all coexist in this crazy Who world. Uh, so with McMurtry's comment, you're starting to see, you're, you're seeing diversities opening up and women's uh, with spaces that were primarily for women or exclusively for women are being opened up in a lot of ways. Uh, maintaining the record of fantasy activity is important because understanding the full story of science fiction and fantasy is not possible without understanding not only the actual creative products, but the popular reader reaction to them. People see something in these universes that drive them to create, to expand upon, to creatively analyze, and in some cases to artistically surpass the original product. And there's value in preserving the materials that result from that. By preserving the fan's creative record, we work to preserve the voices of female and female identifying fans who in many ways have been left out of the story of fandom and the popular imagination. Women and female identifying fans who write these stories compile the bids, sing the filk, make the art, wear the cosplay, are a significant part of that story. And part of our archival mandate should and must be to let unsung and unknown voices be heard and help ensure a fuller documentary history of science fiction and fantasy genres. Given how significant televised and film media are to those genres, how readers and viewers respond to those media is a key part of the story and deserves our respect and our attention. So in general, to recroate the Mina de Malfoy story from the beginning, once an archive begins to recognize the importance of fan works of all kinds of cultural objects and as subjects of both research and general interest, it attracts not only fans, but other user groups. Once that happens, it not only reinforces for fans the value of their creative effort, something always gratifying to hear and see as an archivist, but encourages future collecting efforts and preservation projects from print digitization to oral histories and beyond. So in the end, what actually happens, so to speak, is the evolution of special collections and rare book libraries into permanent accessible repositories of Spanish history. Uh, thank you for listening to my speed reading there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I'm gonna do the emoji. <coughs> I have so many questions to ask you, Jeremy, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna save it for later. Um, uh, I do want to thank you also for um, providing me access to the uh, slash fic archive at Texas and um, um, so uh, just yeah just give you a little shout out. All right, fantastic. Our next presenter is Kate Coker. Um, and I'm going to hand it over. Kate is part of uh, you are on the foundation board for the Peter Nichols Prize, right? Um, and you are also scholar, curator, librarian. Amazing, yeah. So I'm gonna hand I'm it off. I'm a nerd. Nerd first. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so now for something like completely different. Um, one of the things that like literally occurred to me like last night that I did feel like maybe we should talk about is when it changed in librarianship. Um, just just kind of like a little pre preface before I really go off. So one thing I do want to gently point out is that the makeup of this panel is profoundly unusual for for librarianship librarianship is a very feminized profession it has been for over 100 years now um and this was itself very controversial there's some early work like there's straight up like an opinion piece in, in one of the early library journals that argues that actually the male librarians should hurry up and mail uh, marry all the female librarians so that they won't have gendered competition in the workplace anymore um but I also want to talk about the fact that, like, when do women have access to libraries? And you'll recall that in Virginia Woolf's Room of One's Own, it literally opens with um, the, 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 the Woolf stand-in being denied entry to a research library because of her lack of letters of introduction. Um, when she was writing, Oxford, of course, it was only allowing women into um, the college, but women were frequently taught separately. And in fact, you know, Tolkien fan here, one of the big things about him was that he was one of the only dons that actually would teach female students during this time period, but he was literally told to like teach them at home because he was married. And so like his wife could like make sure nothing untoward was happening. Um, so, so when we're talking about special collections librarianship too, like this is what all three of us do, and that has an even more contested relationship um, in, in terms of access 
by the public. And one of the things about all three of us is we are, in fact, at um, public institutions. However, Jeremy being at Texas A&M, um, they didn't allow women until the 1960s, um, which was just before the science fiction collection there would have been founded in the 1970s. Um, I'm at the University of Illinois. Uh, women were allowed at my university in the 1870s, uh, which was super unusual. Um, in contrast, if you consider private institutions, um, my colleague Kate Osmond, who I'm going to talk about a little bit more later, uh, has a forthcoming book about the history of um, women bibliographers and the fact that early members of the Grolier Club, the really big prestigious rare book collection in New York, um, they were happy for these uh, American heiresses to literally buy and import entire libraries into the U.S. for research purposes, but the women were not themselves allowed to access them. Women would not be allowed into the Grolier Club until the 1970s. Um, and in fact, another big deal that happened just this past year is the Fellowship of American Bibliographical Societies is dealing with the fact that not all bibliographical societies in America have equitable like entry points. Um, there are still bibliographic societies in the U.S. that will not allow women, that will not allow uh, African Americans people of color and probably subtextually many other people. So going in, let's talk about who has access to what. Um, so yeah, fun times. I'm great at parties. Uh, so one of the problems I always run into with projects and progress is coming up with snappy titles. And this past weekend, when I was trying to actually write this paper and put everything into coherent order, actual footage of me shown trying to do that, um, what occurred to, occurred to me that what I'm actually trying to get at is feminist bibliography bibliography to science fiction boogaloo. Um, and I say this in homage to Joanna Russ, who I do not think would have described herself as a bibliographer, not, because, not least because most people are leery of identifying themselves as bibliographers, despite her landmark work, How to Suppress Women's Writing, which was a huge influence on, on my work in particular. Um, but again, a, a, a hat tip to my friend and collaborator, Kate Osment, who's rational Rationale for Feminist Bibliography, uh, printed in 2020, goes into the politics of bibliographical citation, um, thus not just the erasure of women writers from the record, but also from the bibliographical scholarship um, that is done by women and referenced by male scholars who subsequently drop the women's names off the work. Um, looking for women in, in major bibliographical sources is fascinating ride, y'all. Okay, so in 2016, Kate and I started building the Women in Book History Bibliography, which is essentially drawn from our shared Google Doc collection of 109 secondary source citations that we share as we were working on our dissertations. Uh, these primarily focused on early modern English women writers and book tradeswomen. We were both working on dissertations about the recovery of women and the difficulty of locating scholarly work on the topic due to the haphazard or non-existent subject indexing practices of most journals, databases, and library catalogs. Six years later, we are sitting at some 2,176 citations and there is no end in sight. We have the dual challenges of keeping up with the newest publications in the field that are ever increasing and the vast backlog of material and numerous journals that we have to systematically go through but have not yet done so because it's just the two of us. Um, and that's not even touching the vast gulf of non-English material that we don't have semantic access to. I had a colleague recently ask me about Korean women printers. That's amazing. That's I, I got nothing. I don't have Korean and it's not a topic that is um, addressed in any of the Asian databases that I have access to. Anyone can hook me up. Let me know, please. Um, so when we were assembling our bibliography, the first thing I did was go to the Library of Congress subject headings, uh, subject heading authorities. I'm a librarian. This makes sense to me. I'm not, however, a cataloger, and this will matter very shortly. Um, the authorities are basically the approved headings by the Library of Congress that provide the keywords in, 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 a, in, a, in a formulated way that other libraries can use. Um, and, and they, they are highly political, by the way. It's a big thing in 2020 um, the, when there uh, was finally approved, along with the recognition of uh, the Armenian genocide by the U.S., the fact that the subject heading um, for Ar Armenian massacres could become Armenian genocide. Oh, like 
like 100 years after it happened. Um, pretty similarly, this past year, like, how, how, how do you index uh, the events of this past February? Um, right now, uh, Library of Congress has it as the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, whereas you will look at a lot of news stories where it is instead the, the Russia slash Ukraine war. So, so subject headings and how information is filed is heavily political. Um, I went to the authorities looking for when writers, and it turns out that is not a heading that is commonly used. When it is used, it's actually subtextually linked to children's literature, and thus by surfing uh, the catalogs, you would be given the impression that the most prolific and examined when writers of all time are Laura Ingalls Wilder, Judy Bloom, Beverly Cleary, and so on. Um, there is a subject heading for science fiction, women writers, that is neglected. Um, and if you're wondering about everyone else, well, most of the time they just end up as singular names. Emily Dickinson, much like the cheese, stands alone. Cool. Now, let me back up a second, talk about the challenges in information organization. One of the basic skills of librarianship and archival work is information organization, how to structure information so that people can find what they are looking for and ideally providing multiple pathways to get there. One of the first exercises a library student is faced with is the question of how to organize tableware. When I saw this artist book earlier this year, I had like a visceral flashback to my first like some library science class in 2003. Okay, so sounds easy. How to break down your tableware. You have your eating utensils, you have your glasses, you have your plates. Okay, break that down a bit. What distinguishes uh, salads forks from dessert forks, from regular forks? Is it the number of tines? Is it the size? Is it is it where they are placed on the table? Um, consider briefly what it means that we don't even talk about chopsticks in this exercise. Um, Basic structures of information assume a lot of things, not least the centrality of Westernism. Um, and I'll throw in a fun fact, one of the most significant librarians in the early modern world was Hernando Colon, um, son of Christopher Columbus, who built the largest library of the time and created a series of early subject headings in which to organize it, including geography, theology, literature, history, and intriguingly prognostications of the future. Um, another fun fact, um, the University of Illinois Library has the subject headings for Luton Webb's The Mummy um, identifies 22nd century and forecast, which isn't right, but isn't totally wrong either. And I, I, I love this record, and one day I will have the courage to show it to our catalogers. But right now, I just know it would make them cry, so I haven't done it, and I, I think it's incredibly entertaining. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is a record from, like, the 1920s, possibly earlier. But anyway, um... Uh, Jose Marie Perez Fernandez and Edward Wilson Lee, authors of Hernando Colon's New World of Books towards a Cartography of Knowledge, note that essentially Colon's, Colon's project was the colonization of the human mind. Think about that in terms of how we organize information. Okay, now before we get too far in congratulating ourselves for no longer living in the 16th century, I want to point to two cataloging stories from the 20th. This is Dorothy Porter, who was the original back Black bibliographer. She was the first African-American student to receive a library science degree from Columbia University in 1932. She built the Moreland Spring Garden Research Center at Howard University. Um, she also would not have had access to many of the public libraries in the United States, both as a youth and um, as an adult, because she was Black. And the, the, the segregation of, of public institutions was very real. Um, so, so, so there's that. She, she also pointed out the racism inherent to the Dewey Decimal Classification System, and there's an oral history in which she notes they had one number, 326, that meant slavery, and they had one other number, 325, that meant colonization. Um, in white libraries, every book, whether it was a book of poems by James Weldon Johnson, who everyone knew was a Black poet, went under 325, and she said, she said that was stupid to me. Um, so this idea of all African-American literature, history, et cetera, being under slavery, okay? Um, consequently, she chose to classify works in Howard's libraries by genre and author instead. Now, here's another story. This one takes, you know, this is an amazing book. Go, go buy it and read it. Melissa Adler's 2017 study looks at the history of the Library of Congress classification system and analyzes how LGBTQ titles were historically organized, which is to say because inversion and homosexuality were originally entries in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, all things queer were filed under psychology. 
Um, thus, in 1990, Eve Koskowski Sedgwick discovered that her book, Epistemology of the Closet, now a foundational work of queer theory, was classified by the Library of Congress with books on homosexuality in the history of American literature, which is, again, not totally wrong, but not quite right either. Um, from there, Adler looks at the history of the Delta collection of the Library of Congress to set materials that originally had no public catalog and could only be requested by a specific title that consisted of obscene and frequently queer materials that, the, uh, that had been seized by the Customs Bureau, the Postal Office, and the Copyright Office. Good times all around. So what I'm trying to get at is how structures of information um, what do we know and how do we know it? Um, likewise, the gaps in information, the absences of records and failures to acknowledge and anticipate. And what I'm thinking in particular is that scene in Caprica when an avatar of Zoe Greystone is generated from her life's data, including shopping receipts and all the other little bits that make up her life um, for resurrection um, and artificial life form. I'm not saying the archives are like Cylons, except for how you can claim that there is a plan when in fact there is no such plan. Um, and so I want to kind of get into the ways that the 21st century might be considered an archival dream. The ability to quickly digitize and disseminate texts has never been easier. Um, idealistic fans and researchers note that the extensive online archives free to users that hold complete books, magazines, fanzines, a wide array of other material. However, the 21st century is also an archivist nightmare. Um, digital files degrade over time and libraries and librarians face ever greater challenges in maintaining the digital stability of resources, affording the rise in cost of materials, maintaining space for physical objects, and especially in America, the renewed calls for censorship, book banning, and removal of librarians from their jobs. These are all pieces that, were, that have just appeared since this past September. Um, I, I picked interesting looking ones that, re that really got to the point really short because I wanted this slide to remain legible. Um, the one that I read just the other day, uh, Panero's Library by the Book, um, uh, um, that appears in the Wall Street Journal, is literally an entire thing piece about how librarians should shit up, sh should shut up, and not be talking about white supremacy and the other things that I'm actually talking about right now, um, because cultural literacy and all that is so much more important. Um, this is our world. Okay, the, the complex information ecosystem becomes further complicated when the topic of gender is introduced into the mix. Locating gender and women in metadata, subject headings, and physical materials can become a challenge for the librarian and the researcher, and when researchers are unable to find materials, it becomes very easy to declare that women weren't there. So let me try to break down some of what I run into in, in the art information architecture side of things. I mentioned the women in book history bibliography earlier, but we went from 100 citations to over 2,000. When we started working, our index terms were super basic because we were naive, and guess what? It had a failure to anticipate. So when we were looking at headings for fields, we settled on genre studies to encompass the work we would expect to find, which is women writing, editing, and publishing science fiction, mystery, romance, etc. Now we knew full well that women make up a large number of creators in these fields, but we also knew how seldom they were actually acknowledged in the scholarship. At this point, genre studies encompasses 146 out of our 2,176 citations. On the one hand, not that many. On the other, just enough to make it a challenge to usefully weed down. If I plug in the term science fiction, I can pull up eight citations, and I know that's woeful, and I know it's deeply incorrect. Um, actual apologies to everyone in this room. Okay, let me switch gears and go to the science fiction and fantasy research database, much bigger, God's all bless Hal Hall, who taught me everything I know and took me on, and Jeremy and Leslie K. Swigert to keep this baby going. Um, I am also perennially behind in my share of indexing for the SFRD, but you know, 137,000 entries, that's respectable. Um, if you go into our subject list, here's a bit of what you'll see. Note the entries for women science fiction writers and women writers. Women SF writers has 649 items, while women writers has 29. What's the real difference between these two headings. This is going to sound basic, but to distinguish the women writers who wrote science fiction from those who did not. So for instance, if you need to know about Jane Austen and science fiction, and people do do science fiction criticism and reference Austen, Austen will be get Austen will get picked up by women writers, but not by women SF writers. Um, one of the projects Hal, Jeremy, Leslie Kay, and I have been working on, um, and this is mostly Leslie Kay and Hal, Jeremy, and I putting in our two cents, is updating and consolidating our subject heading system. Topics like Afrofuturism and eco-criticism were extant well before those terms became the common currency, for instance. Um, on the flip side, and pertinent to Adler's work above, the topic of queerness was much more often addressed as homosexuality in the scholarship before the advent of queer theory and the, reclam and the reclamation of the term queer itself. What do you do with queer scholarship before you have queer studies the best you can and then you retcon later. 
Um, if you think about feminist scholarship, which is why I see when indexing for women's book history is for work in the 80s, it's scholarship focusing on reclaiming uh, those writers that are specifically identified as feminists. So for instance, Margaret Cavendish, she has 41 items in the SFRD, 19 in the uh, women's book history bib. There's almost no overlap because one, again, I'm behind, and two, the fields of focus are very different. Science fiction scholarship looks at Cavendish as a pioneer of science fiction. Book history looks at Cavendish as an early feminist. The twain should meet, but not quite yet, because of the structures of knowledge that inform the scholarship and the modes of access that govern their findability. In other words, it's real hard to find what you're looking for when the data hasn't been categorized to your needs ahead of time or to the needs of others. I have a colleague who really wanted to appropriate data in the Women's Book History Bibliography for one of her projects, and I had to tell her to actually please look at the thing because it did not do what she was expecting it to do. Um, she, she wanted all all of the, the, the subject names for, for the women who are identified as printers and bookbinders and so forth, that, that that's not how we put in the names. Uh, we, we, we should have done, but again, failure to anticipate. Um, maybe next decade I can fix that. We are reverse, we, revi blah, 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 revisiting our subject index thesaurus and we're going to kind of, again, retcon and update um, from, from our newly identified headings, but that's its own project it will take time. Um, so to conclude, or at least stop, um, archives and information organization are having a moment of sorts. In the last few years, I've noticed an uptick in calls for papers regarding the theory of archives. The call for the 2023 MLA conference included a proposal for recovering lost archives to ask what and how do we study that which is unseeable or inaccessible. A 2016 call for a conference on archives after the archival turn requested papers that investigate different aspects of archives that include can include theoretical discussions as well as discussions of different forms of archival practices um, and also in artistic interpretations of ar archives. Jeremy and I co-edited a special issue on archives for the Journal of Fandom Studies. Despite being quite specific that we were talking about actual physical institutional archives, we got a lot of theory papers. Um, meanwhile, my colleagues who work with critical theory have never stopped teaching Jacques Derrida's Archive Fever since its initial publication in 1995. Subtitled A Freudian Impression, the slim volume theorizes the archive in terms of Freud's death drive and especially looks at the extensive growth of modern records due to the new technology of email. TLDR and critical theory, the archive is a locus of power and a force for variously, depending on the critic, nationalism, white supremacy, decolonization, the subaltern, heterosexuality, queerness, et cetera, et cetera. Much like Walt Whitman and make of that what you will, the archives can be large, they can contain multitudes. Except, except, except in reality, archives are limited and endangered due to lack of space, personnel, funds, overuse, and abuse. Uh, the field of librarianship, because as previously mentioned, feminized has one of the largest, is one of the largest sites of workplace violence. There are uh, librarians every year who are stalked, attacked, physically accosted, um, and in some cases even murdered on the premises of, of their workplaces. Um, the, the climate catastrophe for the Anthropocene too is a building uh, is building climate control misfunction on neglected energy grids and the brownouts and blackouts of summer. You know what happens when an to an archives when we lose air conditioning in July? We stop pulling materials. We work with what we have. We apologize to researchers. For funsies, here's the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, aka the Doomsday Vault, used to preserve plant diversity, which had a minor flooding problem with melting permafrost in 2017. The limit of the archive is survivability. The limit of the archive is findability. And yes, sometimes the limit of the archive is gendered. Uh, one final note that I forgot to mention when I'm talking about uh, challenges in librarianship and, and following from the great keynote we, we just had, um, it is talking about tenure in librarianship. And Texas A&M, their libra librarians lost their tenure. Um, 30 years of, of tenured librarianship done away with in an instant because of the current administration. So my good colleague Jeremy over here was previously associate professor and he is no longer not. And that's an atrocity. And this is what librarians are looking forward to. I'm going to shut up now, but thank you. And this is where you can find me. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, wow, that was a very intense um paper with so many like brilliant insights i really appreciate that i have questions for you um i'm gonna save them for later uh our next uh paper is uh by dr phoenix alexander uh the jk klein librarian at the university of california riverside uh and a uh prolific science fiction uh, and fantasy 
uh, author in his own right. The paper that he will be delivering today is entitled Excessive Corpse, the Radical SF of Jody Scott. Uh, and thank you again, Phoenix, for um, zooming in at a ridiculous hour. No, thank you, Kate. And thank you to the organizers of this whole amazing conference. Um, and thank you to Kate and Jeremy for those wonderful presentations. Gosh, it's it's certainly sobering, particularly, you know, Kate's reminder, oh, Kat, to um, hear, hear about libraries and archives today and special collections. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, actually, um, Kate. Uh, yeah, Kate uh, Hepner, could you help me share my PowerPoint? Or is this... Do I have to be a host? Oh, um, I, here we go. I should, found it. Never mind. Have, yeah, you should have permission. Got it. Got it, got it. Um, Perfect. Okay, thank you. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes. Hang on. Let me go into. How about that? Are we in presenter mm -hmm. mode? Good. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> so yeah. Um. As Kate was saying, my paper is um titled "Excessive Corpse: The Radical SF of Jody Scott." And um, as typically happens when you deep dive into to archives with uh, a proposed research topic in mind, it sort of changed a bit because I went down a rabbit hole of um, Jodie Scott's bibliography and really trying to find out what happened to some of some of her novels. As, as I'll go on to talk about, a lot of her works, most of her works are unpublished. Um, and so this paper will kind of be a rumination of that and um, the vagaries of publishing as a marginalized creator, particularly, and what that looks like in libraries and archives. <clears throat> and I'll try and be quick because I know we, we need some time for questions and answers. So a little bit about me, uh, I, as Kate Heffner was saying, I um, write SF and curate SF. So um, I'm, I'm increasingly interested in that interplay of creating and archiving um, artwork. Um, these are some of my publications. Um, I guess that it's a special issue of Vector magazine on Greek science fiction and fantasy uh, back in the spring. And um, I'm guest editing another issue with Stuart Baker on libraries and archives in SFF. Um, so if you have any articles that you'd like to pitch about that or to talk about your work, um, please do write me. But um, the Greek aspect is important. I'll come back to it later because um, as we'll see, there are voices in publishing that have an influence on <laughs> creators uh, and that had an influence on Jodie Scott in particular as well uh, and how we respond to that um, in our critical and creative practice becomes as Kate Coker was saying a sort of a means of survival right and thriving in, in an environment that isn't always amenable to marginalized voices but onto onto Jodie Scott herself oh no onto Jay um Lloyd Eaton himself. <laughs> so uh, just a brief overview of the Eaton Collection. It's one of the world's largest uh, catalog collections of science fiction. Um, came to us in 69 and uh, includes over 300,000 items, uh, fanzines, pulps, hardbacks, paperbacks, author's papers, you name it. Um, you can have a have a look at us uh, online with links I'll provide at the end. So Jodie Scott was born in 1923 in Chicago and she died in Seattle in 2007. Um, this is a list you can see on the screen of her uh, bibliography. Um, only those highlighted in blue were published as far as I can tell and I should say this is preliminary research uh, into her life and career. Uh, there are there are only 11 boxes in of her papers in our archive, but they are very dense and very, um, there's a lot of material in them. And, you know, as anybody who's researched in these collections knows, it, it, it can take a long time to sort of piece together the timeline and the relationships of an author's career. Um, but Jodie Scott is best known for her novels, uh, Passing for Human and I, Vampire, which are part of the Benaroya series of novels. Benaroya is a character she created and sort of says the protagonist for these three novels. Um, and as you can see, the uh, Passing for Human was published in 77. The sequel, I Vampire, was published in 1984. And then the third in the series, um, Devil May Care, also titled just, also alternatively titled Just Say No, didn't come out until 2017. Um, now, I know these, these versions at the bottom have 2015 and 2016, but those were reprints of the first two. But the actual third novel wasn't actually published until then. Um, so 
why why is that exactly <clears throat> let's start with passing for human this was published in uh, 1977 and you you'll see in teeny tiny font on the screen <clears throat> a um, synopsis of the novel that that's from her papers and in short it's about um, an alien uh, species called the Rycemians whose um, emissary the uh, titular character Benaroya goes to earth um, with the idea of inf infiltrating human society to defeat the space fascist Scalzo, who is described here as the Hitler of the spaceways. Um, and I titled this paper Excessive Corpse because one of the things that's that one of the things that's notable about this novel and this character is that she frequently um, dies in her physical body. She's able to switch consciousness. Her real body, quote unquote, is of a dolphin-like creature um, that's off planet, but she's able to, uh, she's able to inhabit different human presenting characters. Um, and this is one of those novels that is, is very satirical and features real, real life characters such as Abraham Lincoln um, and so on. And so part of the, as I was reading the tr the novel, I was thinking about how this character sort of served or could serve as a proxy for um, an authorial presence, right? Moving fleetly between bodies, moving fleetly between worlds that are very, very hostile to her. Um, and for, for those who are familiar with the plot of Passing for Human, Ben Arroyo has to deal with all manner of unsavory characters, finds herself in extremely you know, tricky positions to negotiate, navigate, very patriarchal. Um, and I thought initially, okay, well, sort of the, the image of the corpse could be seen as interchangeable, unfixed, fluid, a sort of utopian presence in a way. But I, this didn't quite sit well with me the more I did, <laughs> the more I did research into this book and, and into Jodie Scott's career. <clears throat> So um, this is, this is uh, from her notes in 1977. Um, and this is, I think you, you Were Never Lovely is again an alternative title for the book. Um, and one of the things that's striking about Jodie Scott's archive is that it's, it's full of handwritten notes talking about herself um, as almost like reviewing herself or iterating what, what she's trying to do as a writer. So in the um, expanded, Quote on the right hand side, you can see, uh, not since Gulliver and Candide has mankind been so witheringly satirized. So she was she was a very um, self assuredly literary writer. She was always uh, writing of her her um, excellence and her intelligence. In, in and I don't mean this in a negative way. I mean this in a way that. Um, as a marginalized creator who was becoming increasingly frustrated with attempts to break into um, the mainstream of sci-fi publishing, science fiction publishing, sorry, I know sci-fi is a bit of a, a, a spicy and controversial <laughs> term in these circles. Um, she was writing these notes to herself um, and, freak, you know, margin, marginalia notes uh, in a strategy that I, I really think of as a means of actualizing a career for herself, right? Um, and we'll see another example of this later. But again, she she was constantly thinking about not just the plot of her novels. Obviously, the the papers can contain synopses um, and, and character um, notes and that kind of thing. But also what she was trying to do with the novel, right? So so um, all th all three of the Benaroya novels, I would say, are kind of characterized by their satirical nature and excessive nature. The sequel, I Vampire. Um, was published in 1984, and this this again features a character of Benaroy, but it also introduces the character Sterling Oblivion, who is a vampire who runs a dance studio, <laughs> and um, the two form a, a relationship. and And I should say that um, I mean, you see a picture of uh, uh, an image of Virginia Woolf on the cover. Um, Benaroy goes undercover as Virginia Woolf, so so the character is interchangeably known as Virginia Woolf in the in the novel as well. Um, and what's interesting, there is an introduction by Theodore Sturgeon uh, to this edition, and um, he mentions the fact of same-sex relationships. He says, he, uh, he says, uh, I wonder if I can find it, hang on, because it's pretty funny. Okay, um, basically he says that, yes, there is same sex, a relationship, there's a same sex relationship presented in the book, but um, 
Scott, oh, here we go. Jodie Scott slashes at the existence of same-sex love, so offering something that um, is in, an increasing number of people are becoming able to confront, but immediately flips past that and presents the concept of a flaming passion for an extraterrestrial sea pig. So um, he's he's essentially saying, yes, you know, that, that there's there's a there's a radical homosexual element to this book. However, Jodie Scott goes way beyond this and imagines a relationship between a vampire and a sea pig. Although I think to describe a rice seeming as a sea pig is, is slightly unfair. I think they're more like dolphins <laughs> personally and, and you know from the text, but there you go. So it's interesting to think about um, this kind of reading of her work, right? Um, I mean, in queerness in SF, we, you can go, you can go, fully into this, you know, with people accepting, you know, science fiction fandom, typically accepting, you know, aliens and other kinds of wildlife forms, but actual same-sex relationships still a bit taboo, um, at least in this moment in publishing history. So this was a sequel. <clears throat> and then um, skip forward to 2017, Th this, now, uh, this, this was another research rabbit hole because I was desperately trying to see if this book was in print. Um, and the answer is kind of. Uh, this uh, red, ready blue cover is available um, online. You can definitely definitely get the Kindle edition and I think you can get a paperback edition as well. Um, um, but it's it, it's been a bit odd. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> but but the, all, all of the trilogy were reissued with these with these kind of covers. Um, uh, because it was considered too, and this novel in particular was considered too far out uh, to be published, uh, you know, in its in its time, which again was around the late eighties, so the same about the same time as I Vampire. Um, but to return to that, um, and just to briefly touch upon, I think some of some of what uh, Kate Coker was saying about the uh, hostility, right, of the genre to particularly female authors that you'll find a lot of letters uh, not not just the notes and personal notes of Jodie Scott in her papers that talk about her frustrations with the publishing industry um, and how annoying it is that that what she's trying to do is not recognized and valued by the genre um, but she also writes letters um, really appealing to folks to actually um, call this out right and, and trying to find allies among her peers so um this is this is a letter uh to hank stein and january frank from 1983 so just before i vampire comes out um and so she says that um uh which is which is a bit to point out Oh yes, I'm interested in great literature. What is currently known as SF and F is a nicely decked out but unembalmed corpse about ready to fall in on itself. So she doesn't hold back her words about the state of uh, how she how she is seeing uh, science fiction. And now, it, obviously, in the 1980s, there are there are women novelists writing um, Octavia Butler for one. But I think in general, um, Scott is very frustrated, right, at this at the state of science fiction. And and this is this is something that I think takes on a special significance from a marginalized creator because, um, you know, we can all have spicy takes about the, you know, the state of the field and goodness knows science fiction fans have been bemoaning it since, you know, at least for at least a hundred years. But I think when it becomes a barrier to um, someone like Jodie Scott, then we, we sort of sit up a bit and take it, you know, take her at her word a bit more seriously. Um, and I love the image of the unembalmed corpse thinking back to, uh, how I was reading Passing for Human. And so if you have on the one hand, this fleet movement of, you know, switching genres, switching bodies, switching forms that the character takes on in the novel, uh, Jodie Scott is sort of uh, counterbalancing this with this idea of like a stinky, unembalmed, rotting <laughs> corpse of General SF uh, that is about to collapse because it isn't actually accommodating and making room for genuinely innovative voices. Um, and I'll speed up a bit, sorry. Um, and again, uh, this this was what sort of on, on that point in Passing for Human, uh, Scott says she wanted to explore the ultimate innocent, a person who is joyous and free it has, and hasn't had all the social conditioning we've had. So um, my two second sort of reductive reading of that is, is precisely in the manner I just mentioned. Um, ben Arroyo and really the book as a whole is um, a satirical, hard to pin down, uh, ostensibly genre work that is trying to move through the social conditioning of science fiction as a genre and present something genuinely new. And I'm, personally, I'm quite confused about, I'm well, not confused, but 
Um, it's interesting to me that um, Scott isn't as talked about, say, as Joanna Russ, uh, and we can we can talk about that um, later. So whizzing through again, this is another letter to a fan from 1986, uh, and in it she is imploring folks to. Um, uh, start a campaign to get publishers to buy my books, you can see in that second line there. Um, and again, it's interesting, the power dynamic, thinking about the power dynamic power dynamic between creators and publishers. Um, and just on the uh, notion of self, self-actualization, self-iteration, on the right-hand side here, you can see the famous sort of, or well, now famous, I guess, uh, image uh, from Octavia E. Butler's archives, which were full of these, you know, mantras, I will be a best-selling author. I will find a way to do this. You can see at the bottom there, my books will be read by millions of people. Um, and then Scott has a really lovely, um, I, I sort of put them side by side because Scott does a really similar thing in her papers. And there's a lovely mantra at the top there, which I think is on the next slide that I've blown up. As an artist, you have a duty to expose the truth as you know it. A novelist does this in a form of a story. But in today's market, there is no room for that. And um, it seems the truth is the last thing anybody wants to hear. Um, and so it's, it's sort of this balance of artistic vision and artistic frustration, right, at the field that she's circulating in. Um, and I'll just end by saying that I mentioned the Greek SFF earlier, uh, and it's you see a lot of these debates play out online now. And something I found personally frustrating is is uh, the the sort of oft repeated belief that you know oh we you know we're sick of greek we're sick of greek retellings we're sick of the greek myths um and so there's a, there's like a i would say there's a there's a strong and vocal contingent of contemporary greek science fiction writers uh, eugenia Driandafilou, natalia theodoridou just to name two who are sort of pushing back against that and trying to claim our own space in the field right um and a final note i guess to folks who who do work creatively themselves and, and even you know not, not creatively in your but in your work in general um, take care of how you archive yourself, you know, do these, uh, incorporate these practices into your work, make sure you date things as well, write down any thoughts of inspiration, um, you know, if you loved something, if you hated something, because years down the line, I think these kinds of literary traces are really important, not just to show sort of how you survived as an, as an author and as a creator, but um, to leave a tra leave a sort of a um, an inspiring blueprint for others, right? Who come after, even if our present is not perfect. I think there are ways that, um, in a slightly, admittedly utopian thinking about science fictions and archives, that our own archives can actually, hopefully, inspire others going forward. Um, and I will stop there, uh, so we um, can have some Q and A. And here are some links. At the end, you can find uh, UCR's website there, Special Collections University Archives. Online um, Archive of California has lots of great resources. Um, email me, uh, tweet me on the, on the Now Hell site of Twitter um, <laughs> for as long as that lasts. And thank you again for listening. And I will stop sharing. Oh, fantastic. All right, emoji clap, emoji clap, everybody. You don't have to, it's fine. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just hitting it like a lot, like a ton. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, Jeremy, are you? Okay, great. So for folks in the chat, please feel free to um, drop questions or comments um, that I can go ahead and forward to the speakers. Uh, we have about five minutes or so before, yeah, we have about five minutes. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and drop that into the chat. <clears throat> All right, so I guess I'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, Kate, I really was uh, totally inspired and uh, your, your paper and presentation was electric. Can you speak to the ways, um, the resources that um, librarians and archivists um, you know, can access like mental health or how maybe these communities come together for creating like mental health um, zines or um, just speak about like the, the profession because you ended on a very um, serious note about the issues of um, working with the public um, as a librarian, curator, archivist, uh, and the issues um, that you run up against um, from the general public, especially in the States, so. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm cheerful. Um, well, one of the things that really struck me early on in my career was at my first 
ALA conference that I ever went to and straight up an icebreaker was, so when was the first time you ever hit the panic button? Um, like, like what was the moment that was, that, that really scared you? And I thought, huh, that's interesting. Um, my, my first moment with a panic button was a student who came in with, with, with knives and was carving up a table one time. That was great. Um, I mean, everyone has, has their different things, but I think it's something to keep in mind is how those, how, how those problematic interactions get shaped both by gender and by race. Um, another thing that is kind of under underexplored in terms of librarianship, but has come up a lot more in the last five years, is African-American students and professors uh, being harassed for being um, in university libraries just minding their business, reading their books, doing their work, and white people saying, do they really belong here? Like, yes, yes, they do. Um, and, and, and in terms of like mental health access, that's great. And I know, and thank you for dropping in the the, the, the Twitter hashtags um, for, for uh, um, people working in the field. I think that's great. Um, yeah, uh, Phoenix has a question in the chat, or, or there's a question for Phoenix. And I'm going to like, Phoenix, all right. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, forward this question to you. If you hadn't, if you did not um, answer it already, um, are you so? Jonathan Thornton uh, of the University of Liverpool asked, "Are you working to bring any of the Jody, any of Jody Scott's unpublished works you mentioned, into print? So anthologies or um, republishing?" Yeah, that's an excellent question. I was just typing out a lengthy answer, then I was like, wait, I could just answer it <laughs> by speaking. Um, short answer, yes, I would love to. So this paper sort of marks my like initial stages of really diving deep into the archive and getting a sense of Jody Scott's work and Jody Scott's career. Um, as you've seen, there's plenty of unpublished stuff. Um, we are in, obviously are in contact with her estate. Um, and the uh, the I mean to do to do justice to this kind of project it requires a lot of of work um, and so I think for me going forward um, it I would want to make sure I do it right <laughs> uh, I would want to make sure that I'm the right person to do that first of all which I'm still you know I'm I'm not sure I'm sort of feeling my way forward so I think personally I'm more comfortable in giving others the tools to do this. Um, and being a support and an ally of that, but it's certainly a project that I really want to want to um, at least initiate because um, you know Jody Scott is such an important figure, and so I, I sort of put it back to you know the audience and to your networks. If there are any scholars of feminist SF uh, who would love to edit an edition of Jody Scott's papers, you know, come come visit us, come and you know, or, or just reach out if you want um, scan requests, you know. We, and um, and do that work if you want to, and and I will I will happily help that. But should that was a long answer, short answer? Yes, like I would really want to do that in some form. But thank you for the question. It's a wonderful question. Um, I'm a fan. So anything I can help with on the review and publicity side of it when it does happen, just uh, give me a shout. Thank you, thank you. And I should mention, Jonathan is a amazing reviewer and scholar and an author, I believe, of science fiction um, too. So thank you for that, Jonathan. Awesome. Okay, in the can I just ask one last question um, before we uh, end this uh, panel? Jeremy Brett, I have uh, been fortunate to see you present at many panels um, on different objects um, within uh, at Texas A&M. Can you um, tell the audience about some of the objects within your collections um, that you find like the most um, quirky or interesting or something um, that you uh, that you particularly um, get excited about um, within your within your collections? Oh, I need, that's a new question. Uh, I should, I need like to have like a pat answer prepared for this because we get asked it a lot. Um, well, there's a, certainly a from, well, uh, here's two very different things. So on the one hand, one of the most popular things that get looked at, and Kate will know this, but Kate, Kate preceded me in my job, um, are the, and the, this part of the collection has grown a lot more since Kate was here. Uh, so 
Among our archival donors, we have the papers of George R. R. Martin, so, you know, of Song of Ice and Fire, and Martin gives us, in addition to his manuscript and correspondence, all the other stuff you expect to have with that, that kind of uh, collection, he gives us all, like, merchandising doodads that he gets sent and says, like, what am I going to do with this, and probably sent it to us so we can hold it for him, so thank you. Um, but... Um, so what some among the items he's given us are uh, a series of replica weapons that are based on the props from the television show, and those are popular enough to be looked at, and so they are most of them are on permanent display that rotate because people want to see them so much. And it's a fun, it's a fun, I, the scholarly value of them is probably negligible, but they are a good way of like bringing in people to special collections who don't really think special collections hold something that interests them. So they're important for that reason. Um, the other the other item I mentioned that's particularly important to me personally is. We have, it's a partial manuscript, and it is uh, an old school manuscript, like a notebook paper um, from Kenneth Lee. It's the manuscript for her first book, Don't Bite the Sun. Um, not her first published book, but the first book she ever wrote. She wrote it in 1960, uh, when she was around 18. So do the math. Yeah, that's about right. Um, what's funny about this is, so I have been in communication with her. Um, I took this job a couple of years before uh, Tanith died, and it was kind of, I sort of very, I geek, I fanboyed out because I've always loved Tanith's work, and it was the, she was the first adult fantasy writer that I ever read. Um, and she gave us this manuscript, um, but it's fun because a not only her, her writing, her handwriting is atrocious. That's one thing. Two, uh, she um, you know she includes little bits with it, like little sketches of little animals and costumes and uniforms and things that she had I, I envisioned for the for the book. Um, but what's particularly important to me is she wrote on the cover page of the manuscript notes to me, giving me more context about mm -hmm. where they came from, that, you know, that her mother was her first leader, that she wrote that she, you know, what was she writing this on, like, the, like the one on the back of one of her piece of notebook papers, like a partial job application. So she was like, you know, scraping up all any paper she could get. So I find there's a lot of joy in that for, as a, as a fan of hers, but also as a, as a, as an archivist to collect the kind of very fundamental um, foundational material that shows you how text, where texts come from, and how they evolve over time. So that's 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 one example I have to collect. Fantastic. I will save the quick the other question about Ming Watney archives, aka the garage that it came from, uh, on Facebook, um, and also some of the uh, sexy R two D two C three P O slash fanzines um, that occupy a good portion of my mind and I enjoy it. Um, great. Thank you so much for this panel. Um, everyone was fantastic. Thank you, Phoenix Alexander, Kate Coker, and Jeremy Brett. Please follow them on all of the socials and um, stick around for the other panels. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, especially Kate, for putting this, for running this panel. Oh, I love everyone in this bar. <laughs>